Locked on Rams and Locked on Cardinals listeners, welcome back to another episode here of these podcasts. Of course, as you guys can tell, for those that are watching on YouTube, the background, this is another crossover episode here, the first divisional game between the Rams and the Cardinals. And we're going to dive into everything you need to know about this contest, matchups to watch, how we got to where we are. Of course, the Rams are 3-0, the Cardinals are 3-0. This is the first divisional game. It's going to be a good one. I'm your host of the Locked on Rams podcast. So Sacramento's and I'm joined by locked on Cardinals co-hosts Bo Brock and Alex Clancy and guys this is a good game I mean let's be honest here uh both teams sitting at three and oh somebody's got to lose probably I would assume that it's not going to be a tie uh this one's going to be in Los Angeles at SoFi Stadium so the Rams kind of have that neck up advantage there but not too much traveling for the Cardinals team either so I mean I think most people probably expected the Rams to be somewhere in this range here at three and zero. They were probably considered by a lot of people a Super Bowl contender. The Cardinals, on the other hand, they look like one of the surprising teams in the NFL this season. So I want to kick it off to you guys first. How did the Cardinals get to the spot at three and zero, and how are they looking so far throughout those first three games this season? I mean, they seem to be growing up in front of our very eyes. Uh, yes, you get lucky uh, with with um, Minnesota's kicker missing the extra missing the field goal at the end of the game, sure. But the Cardinals are three and zero. This is the classic big brother, little brother. Let's see if the little brother can finally be the big brother on the basketball court or, you know, in this in this case on the gridiron. It's it's a very exciting time to cover and be a fan of the Arizona Cardinals because there is still some uncertainty and some question marks as to how legitimate the three and zero record is, whether it be the you know the opponents they played, if they can go up against the best and beat the best. But this is Bo and I have talked. This is the best time for the Cardinals to play the Rams. Let's find out right away. First quarter of the season, let's find out what the Cardinals are made of. And I think it's going to be a hell of a game on Sunday for fans and media members alike. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, when, uh, Bo, I'll kick it over to you here in a second. But, um, I mean, like, let's be honest here. This team is maybe not being expected to start at 3-0. and I mean, the offense is clicking. The defense looks pretty much just as good. Um, I, w- I don't necessarily want to ask you what's the ceiling for this team, but is there kind of any surprise that they started off this quickly? You know, Kyler Murray taking that next step so quickly in his career here. You know, th- there's surprise, but then there's also this, they did expect to be at least three. And I'm they're, they're They were favored in each and every game. I mean, not, not the game against the Tennessee Titans, but once you kind of saw that the Titans were down, they had new coordinators on both sides of the ball. They were a little rusty that it was very real that uh, they were going to experience issues by not having that time together and implementing Julio Jones, uh, the Arizona Cardinals were able to kind of expose them early on and and they took care of business in Nashville. And then after that, you know, it's been an interesting ride up and down, but I think everybody kind of expected them to kind of be here. And if they weren't, there would be a lot more questions to be answered for this organization. This is the true test of the 2021 season and it's week four and they're undefeated. And if they're kind of sent packing or sent home with their tail between their legs, you know, everybody, the the sky could fall in the Phoenix metropolitan area, (laughs) or, you know, if they can show that they're, 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 they belong. I think people are going to walk around the streets of Phoenix with their chest puffed out high, that this team is what Steve Kime envisioned this off season and in contention for a playoff spot in one of the toughest divisions in the league. Sosa. Yeah, I mean, this division, it's a dogfight. It's going to go down to the wire, I think. And right now, so far, uh, we're getting our money's worth. I mean, this division looks potent. There's a lot of teams. I I could see all four teams making the playoffs. Let's be real here. So, you know, I'm looking at the other end of the spectrum here for the Rams. As I mentioned, there's really been not that many surprises here. I mean, for everyone that's kind of covered this team, uh, fans, everyone that's looked at this team throughout the offseason, You know, they push all their chips into the middle of the table. They trade Jared Goff. We know that. They go get Matthew Stafford. And they made this move to get to the ultimate dance, the big dance, the Super Bowl. And, of course, we can't exactly speak on that just yet. But so far, the experiments worked out perfectly. I mean, Matthew Stafford looks like one of the guys that's going to be in the contention for the MVP award alongside Kyler Murray. Uh, Looks like arguably one of the best quarterbacks in franchise history already through three games. I mean, the numbers would suggest that that is the case. The offense, arguably the best in football. The defense maybe took a little bit of a step back so far. But I mean, anytime you guys have, you know, Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, players like that, you can probably expect a little bit of a positive regression going towards the middle of the season. So, so far, it's been a very strong start for the Rams as well. Both teams at 3-0. and It's going to be very fun to watch this game. One of two this season, of course. And it is the first Rams 
divisional game. I want to say it's also the first divisional game for the Cardinals. I may be wrong on that, but it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can see you guys head nodding. So, yeah, it is definitely uh, going to be a good one. I think this is going to be a stepping stone to see where these teams are kind of looking in this season, right? I mean, the Rams are probably expected to win this game. I know Sean McVay has never lost a game against the Cardinals. He's sitting at 8-0. And uh, he's good friends with Cliff Kingsbury, so they kind of can rib each other back and forth in terms of what happens. But like you guys mentioned, too, I mean, the Cardinals can sort of slay the dragon here. It's that big brother uh, relationship where, I mean, if the Cardinals come out on top in this game, I think a lot of that national media is going to change up here. And I'll kick it quickly to you guys just for a uh, opinion on that. I know Alex was a little bit animated when it came to that power ranking that we had at the <laughs> Lock on Podcast Network <laughs> sitting at eighth place. If the Cardinals win this game, where are we looking? Are we looking I mean, top five for the cards or what? Yeah, I mean it's horse manure. It really is. But <laughs> let me let me just let me let me just ask you something. Yes, everything you said is true. Matthew Stafford with that beautiful mop of lettuce he's got coming in town with that big dome of his coming in, and he has no run game again. Used to it, you know. And obviously Daryl Henderson is probably going to come back on Sunday. We'll talk about that in the second segment. But let me ask you quickly: How many damn chips? does this organization have they've done this four times pushing everything into the middle they're going to be a, a division three school in 10 years it seems like with the li- with the little amount of first round picks they're going to have is the matthew stafford cooper cup relationship what you're going to ride this year like is that the baseline yeah you know i think it kind of has to be like you mentioned there's no chips left uh, at this point it's like when you're you're playing poker with your boys you guys are having a few beers someone turns to the left you're stealing chips from him you're pushing his chips into the middle too so it's kind of where the rams are right now they have to rely on the players that they have the superstar uh talent that they have because this is a very high-end roster we know that and so they got to rely on the staffers the cups the ramseys the donalds these are the guys that have to carry the load for everyone else and uh when you look at your team you guys the one that you guys cover bo it's a little bit top heavy as well. You know, you look at some of these players uh, on the offensive side of the ball, I specifically want to look at, Mm -hmm. you look at Kyler Murray, right? And we know he's one of those MVP contenders right now who around him has sort of helped him sort of shoulder that load on that offensive side of the ball because they've been as explosive as any offense in football right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a combination. One, the play calling has taken a little step forward. You know, it's gonna we're gonna see how it tests against one of the top defenses, at least from last season, and Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey. But we knew there was DeAndre Hopkins, right? And DeAndre Hopkins three touchdowns through three games, uh, battling a rib injury. We'll see what he looks like come Sunday. But then you've got those guys, this the playmakers opposite DeAndre Hopkins, Rondale Moore, the second rounder out of Purdue, has been electric. In his first couple games, he had his first hundred yard game in game two of this week two of this season. AJ Green had a hundred yard performance against the Jaguars, and Christian Kirk in a contract year, the fourth year receiver, is really stepping up and become a clutch option in the slot for Kyler Murray. So you're seeing that in this offensive line kind of uh, settle in. They've only allowed seven hits on Kyler Murray this entire season, five sacks. So it's just been a big, you know, group effort as far as this offense is concerned, and it has to be. And, uh, you know, to to come to the Arizona Cardinals defense, you know, they haven't beaten Sean McVay since the Obama era. But let's keep in mind, you know, the big brother picking on the little brother here. The Cardinals were a bad team those years. Very bad team. And Kyler Murray was drafted in 2019. And this is they're growing up and they're catching up. And now we're going to see if once once it's a level playing field, you know, can Kyler Murray start to beat his big brother? Can Cliff Kingsbury be good enough? to compete with Sean McVay. I think this is the first test of that. Those games before, sure, Sean McVay and those Rams, they should have won those games. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, we're going to find out in this game, of course, we're going to dive into some of this defensive stuff as well. I got a very good question for you guys. I got to know about how that defensive line is looking as well as that secondary. I know there was a lot of question marks uh, coming into the season. For those guys, you guys can follow us on Twitter at QB's MEP, at Clancy's Corner, and at Bull Brock. And we want to thank you guys so much for always making us your first daily listen here at the Locked On Podcast Network. I want to tell you guys about a very great app here that everyone should download if you drive a car, if you com- if you commute anywhere, you got to get it. It is free. It is called Get Upside. You can get cash back for all your gallons of gas that you're filling up with for up to 25 cents, even up to 50 cents for your first tank. So make sure to download the free Get Upside app. The code is touchdown, just in case you guys missed it. The code is touchdown, free gas money. I mean, you can't go wrong here. So make sure to download the free Get Upside app. And now we can dive into the second segment here and take you guys into this defensive line. I got to ask you guys about it. I haven't had a you know clear eye in terms of looking at how these guys have paired. I know Chandler Jones had that strong coming out party in week one, but 
when you look at J.J. Watt, Chandler Jones, there was probably a lot of hype going into this season between these two guys. Jones obviously didn't play last year. J.J. Watt, pretty damn good himself. So how have these guys paired? How have they looked in terms of just themselves? And are they, you know, as good as advertised as they were coming into the season? I don't know. I mean, like, like we saw in week one, the Cardinals were the best defense to ever grace the gridiron in the <laughs> NFL. Chandler Jones was back. You know, this is his contract year, five sacks, two of which were strip sacks that, that led the points. Like they came out like gangbusters. Evan Collins was behind the line of scrimmage. JJ Watt lived behind the line of scrimmage and Chandler Jones was having tea parties back there with Ryan Tannehill. Um, they've been a little Jekyll and Heidi since, you know, they played one good game out of two weeks, one bad half early with, the the run attack uh, against Minnesota, coupled with Kirk Cousins, you know, having his own tea party behind the line of scrimmage, and then the second half for a little bit of against Jacksonville. But all in all, and the the defense of the pass rush has been good. It hasn't been bad, and it's allowed the secondary, which has stepped up in its own right, to kind of be more opportunistic, as we've seen with Byron Murphy, etc. Um, and take opportunities. And you know, we had that a pick six last week as one of them. But I mean, you agree with me on that, right? Not necessarily. I mean, I think this defensive line that you're going to see, especially last week against Jacksonville, that they were winning the game. You know, they were putting Trevor Lawrence in a position where he was not, uh, he was rattled and he was making bad throws and setting this defensive secondary up to make plays. You know, it might not have shown up as far as big sack numbers, but as far as pressure on Trevor Lawrence, they were certainly get there, getting there. There was, there's been kind of a, uh, uproar from Cardinals fans and, and people who kind of can't look beyond the the box score and JJ Watt and his impact on this defense. And he's winning his, he's winning his assignment each and every play. It seems like, I mean, he's, he's getting to the quarterback and making things uh, very uncomfortable. Sure. He doesn't have a sack to show for it, but he's also, you know, he's slowing down the run game. He's being an elite pass rusher as far as slowing down the run game. And uh, I just think that, Vance Joseph is trying to get Chandler Jones in those one-on-one -on -one situations because I think the Arizona Cardinals believe that he's the most talented player on this defense and they want to set him up for success. So you're going to see J.J. Watt kind of play this, this uh, supporting role, which is odd, but that's where he's at. So I, I kind of buy more into it than Alex, and but I think Alex knows what the what you know what's possible with this this uh, pass rush, which it can be very special. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we're still early in the season, so we haven't seen the peak of what, you know, can become between these guys. They're obviously new teammates, still kind of working with each other and finding out what's new there. But uh, one of the areas that I have to ask about, it's this secondary. I mean, a lot of question marks. I know you guys have ribbed at Patrick Peterson. He's no longer there. Uh, we've seen a lot of Pat Pete over the last few years, over the last decade or so. So how does this new secondary look? Who are the starting corners at this point? I don't even know. I mean, guys are retiring <laughs> two days before the season starts. So uh, how does this secondary look? I, I know they had a nice game last week against the rookie, but uh, yeah. in general, just some of the names and some of the players. I mean, I, I think that Byron Murphy is going to be a household name before you know it. And it's not just because he had two picks. He emerged in week one. He had a busted coverage in week two to open up the game against the Vikings. But outside of that, he's been very good. And then Robert Alford, who's kind of a familiar name. He was part of a Pretty good secondary in Atlanta when they made that run to the Super Bowl 28-3. He was part of that, okay? But he was also on the shelf the last two seasons, and he's played very well for a guy that hasn't played in two years in the NFL. And then fourth-round pick, Marco Wilson, is a guy who ran a sub-440. He's a guy who had a 43-and-a-half-inch vertical. And then the biggest question was, what's between the years? And so far, Alex and I talked to him in the offseason, and he just seems to have the right mindset. I'm just here to learn, and he's been playing very well through the first three games of his career. And uh, those are the three guys that you know about. Quentin Dunbar just signed with the organization. I don't know what his impact could potentially be this week. Is it going to be 2019 Quentin Dunbar? Is it going to be last season where he was really bad? I mean, worse coverage than like a SI swimsuit bikini. <laughs> he just he couldn't cover at all. It was bad. So the secondary, it's, it's a lot better than people bought into. That seemed like there was the biggest need, but the organization knew differently. They scouted their players. They believed the development and the step that Murphy was going to take and the guys that they had drafted. And uh, so far, so good. But, you know, a bad performance against Cooper Cup and Robert Woods could change the perception of this secondary. Yeah, that's certain, uh, certainly something I'm looking out for. I mean, you know, they had a lot of tests already. You talk about Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, guys like that, arguably the best duo in football, but. 
Cooper Cup's on a different kind of tear right now, man. That guy looks like nobody can stop him. So those guys are definitely going to be tested here. The last question here I got for you guys in terms of this defense, I just got to know more. How's this pairing been between the two players almost that feel like they don't even have positions? Uh, you're looking at Zayvon Collins and a guy like Isaiah Simmons. I mean, you could say they play in the secondary. You could say they play in the D-line. You could say they play in the linebacker core. There's really no designation for what these guys do. How have they looked? How has that pairing been? And how have they been used throughout these first few weeks? You know, this was probably the biggest question mark. Uh, Steve Keim, to some people, uh, correctly, to many, including me, um, uh, ridiculously named Zayvon Collins the starter four months before the season started, said, hey, Jordan Hicks, thanks for your service. You can look for a trade now. And Jordan Hicks has played 100%. He played 100% of the snaps on Sunday, Bo. He's been playing a lot. Zayvon Collins has been playing around 40% of the snaps. We've seen Zayvon Collins look like he belongs, especially in the preseason, where it's like, man, this dude's a baller. This dude's an NFL player. Isaiah Simmons last year looked lost for a lot of the early portion of the NFL season. Couldn't get on the field, couldn't get his rhythm. He showed flashes towards the tail end and had probably the biggest defensive play last year was the interception of Russell Wilson. Uh, to set up a win for the Arizona Cardinals on Sunday night football. Um, Isaiah Simmons looks like an NFL player this year. You know, he just looks like he's a linebacker. I mean, he's he he's he stood up Derrick Henry on the goal line by himself and kept him out of the end zone on the half yard line. So the dude's an absolute baller. We saw him ball hawking uh, you know, uh blitz packages and stuff, but all in all, Zayvon Collins is still a work in progress. I mean, he's a rookie, it's been three weeks. We haven't seen him a lot. He hasn't made a whole lot of impact, but but um he's you know he, he's a work in progress. And should the Cardinals have drafted a corner, we don't know. That, that's kind of a tired conversation at this point. But I think Bo would agree. I mean, I, at this point, who knows that all in all, it's been okay. Isaiah Simmons was looked to be the guy that would be under Zayvon Collins' tutelage when the season started, and that shifted in the foundation of Jordan Hicks being there has helped immensely just kind of right the ship a little bit and keep the floor a little bit higher than what it could have been, you know? So, I mean, and that's where we're at. And I think there's, it's just, it's a work in progress. And we're going to find out on Sunday if Cooper Cup and Robert Woods are going to eat their lunches or not. That's enough from us. Alex Lancey Bobrock, Locked on Cardinal Sosa, Cremendous, Locked on Rams, one of our favorites to talk about. Coming up next, it's going to be Sosa's line in the firing squad. Alex, or Bo and I are going to be um, diving, uh, diving a little deeper into what the hell the Rams are doing to be so successful after coming off a win against the reigning Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Bucks this past Sunday. Alex Clancy, Bo Brock, locked on Cardinals. Soldier Cremendous, locked on Rams. Crossover Thursday. We will be right back. But first, rockauto.com. Rock Auto is a savior for me because I don't know jack about cars. Um, I don't like to go to chain storefronts. Be like, hey, man, I'm 38 years old. Can you show me where things are? Because I don't know anything. Uh, I don't like doing that. I've done that the entirety of my life until I found out about rockauto.com. They're a family-owned business. They've been online for 20 years. Everything's streamlined. You don't get upcharge at chain storefronts and because you're not a manufacturer. It's easy. You go to the search box, paint, please, and you pick your car, your model, whatever. It's on your doorstep a couple days later. Super easy. Again, the prices are reliably low. They're a family-owned business. They treat you like family. Go to rockauto.com. Right, locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box. So they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Bo Brock. Let's talk about the incredible little shrinking line between the Cardinals and the Rams. What did it start at six and a half? Now it's at four and a half. Check it out. BetOnline.ag. That total continues to be astronomical. 54 and a half. Oh, the odds makers, they think that this thing is going to be an absolute just boat race. We'll see what happens between the Arizona Cardinals in the Los Angeles Rams. If you feel like you know what's going to happen, go to betonline.ag, throw some shekels down on it, and if you haven't made yourself a little account there, you can get yourself a big old bonus, a welcome bonus, 100%. That's double your initial deposit just for signing up. Don't forget to use the promo code NFL100 because Bet Online is your number one spot for all pro and college football action this season. With a new updated site, interface, email odds, props, and contests, betonline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football from football basketball boxing right to your favorite vegas casino games don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season bet aligns the fastest easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports bet online your online sports book experts 
All right, final segment. This is the scary time for Cardinals fans because we get a little insight into what the hell is going on with the L.A. Rams and the elixir that Sean McVay is putting in his cauldron ahead of Sunday's matchup, the ninth matchup with him as head coach. He is 8-0, a couple uh, couple goose eggs, I believe, during that plight where the Cardinals didn't put up any points. Uh, Alex Clancy, Bob Rock, Locked on Cardinals. Sosa Cremendous at QB's MVP on Twitter. Locked on Rams does a great job over there, dude. It's always We always get excited when we get to talk to you twice a year. So I'm glad that we get to do it on YouTube now. Um, so let's dive into this. I talked a little bit about Cooper Cup earlier. Tyler Higby, obviously a four-letter word here in Phoenix with the utilization of him over the last couple seasons. Talk to me about what Matthew Stafford has done to change the culture. So I, I mean, personally, from a step back, I feel like Jared Goff got a little bit of a raw deal. I think he's a little bit better quarterback than people give him credit for, but he's not the cool dude that Sean McVay needs. Matthew Stafford is that good old Georgia boy with a big old mop. And he just, all he does is, is, is huck it down the field. Tell me what he's done to change the culture, at least from the quarterback room projecting onto the entire roster. Yeah, he's done everything. I mean, you look at, like you mentioned, he's that calm, cool demeanor. Like this guy does not feel bad about making a mistake. I know he threw a pick in week two and it wasn't exactly his fault. The ball was batted, but Man, the guy has no conscience, and you need to play quarterback like that where you're going to be able to put those mistakes behind you, move on to the next drive, the next play, and just keep going. And he's never going to be shy to push that ball deep. And I think that's really just the biggest difference right now between himself and Goff, where you see Goff make a mistake, and he was very calm and cool as well, but almost to a degree where you never seen any passion out of him. It was always very quiet. It was always down and just very monotone in general, right? And I think things just became stale over time. Not that Jared Goff is a bad player or a bad quarterback. I think most people would say that he's a league average quarterback and he's obviously had a lot of success in the league. You can't knock him for that. He's done exactly what was asked of him for the most part, but the problem was the regression over the last two years since going to the Super Bowl in 2018, it just got stale and it got worse and worse and the turnovers started to mount. Uh, a lot of forced fumbles, a lot of interceptions, pick sixes, two to boot. And I think Sean McVay just got tired of it and he wanted to go get his guy. This is his guy now. He did not draft J Jared Goff uh, he inherited Jared Goff. Of course, they did decide to pay him as well. So that's kind of their fault as well. Uh, but now he's got his guy. Stafford is his guy. This is the marriage that he wanted. And it looks good through three games so far. I think Matthew Stafford fits the mold of what he wants in his quarterback, a guy who can spread everything out. He can go in the shotgun five wide, no running back next to him. He knows exactly where his, prote where his protections are, how he's going to set them. And he can progress and read the field very quickly. He knows how to diagnose his matchups. He knows where he wants to go with the football. And I think so far, it's been literally the perfect marriage. Of course, you know, it's a long season. I'm sure they're going to have some up and downs coming up here soon. But at the same time, right now, everything that we were told why the Rams went to go get this guy has come to fruition. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at their games. They, they, they dominated the Bears in the opener on Sunday Night Football, that big coming out party. And then you had, uh, they kind of struggled a little bit with the Indianapolis Colts. The Colts came roaring back in that game. And that's been their real close matchup through three weeks of this NFL season. They were able to take handle the Tampa Bay Buccaneers after one quarter of football, really. What were the Colts able to do that the Cardinals could potentially do to keep this thing close to, to, to really compete with the Rams in week four? Yeah, when you look at that game, like you mentioned, that was the one where they struggled. I mean, week one, week three, not easy, but the Rams really handled those teams. When you look at week two, uh, first of all, it was a road game. It was the one road game that they have played. So maybe a little bit of a hostile atmosphere there that could have kind of knocked them off their, their pegs there. But, you know, I think just in general, Carson Wentz did a very good job at extending plays. And then he didn't really gain any huge chunk plays or anything like that because that's just how the Rams play defense. They're going to prioritize the deep coverage and keep everything in front. But at the same time, there was maybe six or seven sacks that they could have got that Wentz either broke out of or was too mobile to be taken down. And of course, Kyler Murray, I mean, the guy's a jitterbug. He's almost impossible to take down. So probably going to be a little bit of that same type of deal there. But, you know, Wentz is a big, strong guy in that big Ben mold where if you get your hands on him, he's still going to be able to get rid of the ball. So um, that was one of the issues for the Rams there was they just could not complete their sacks. And not only that, but they were very passive defensively in that game. I felt like it was a little bit too off coverage, not very physical, not in your face. They were almost welcoming the Colts to come down the field and take those 8 to 10 to 12 yard chunk plays at a time and just kind of tighten up in the red zone. And of course, they did a good job doing that. They had two red zone stops. One was an interception, one a turnover on downs. But you can't do that all the time, especially against good offenses like the Cardinals. So that is an area of concern. Of course, coming off week three, they looked a lot better, a lot more tight in their coverage. So that is 
a little bit of a you know difference in, in how they played. So we don't really know what to expect in this game, but that's definitely one of the areas that they struggled in in week two. I think just being a little bit too passive defensively. Yeah, and it's interesting. There's a name that most you know non uh, you know, media members or people that watch football um, avidly. Uh, John Johnson's a huge loss for you guys, isn't he? Over the top. I mean, yeah. third round pick in 2017. He went to Cleveland, got paid. Obviously, you can't pay everybody. And the Rams found that out. The Rams are one of the more, at least defensively, if not the most top heavy roster on that 11 starting. I mean, I know that, you know, you have Brockers and Leonard Floyd. That's fine. But Aaron Donald and Jalen Rams are the two best players at their given positions in the NFL. And that's the, you know, that quintessential definition of top heavy losing John Johnson over the, over the top. What has that meant for that defense for the first three weeks? Because it seems like they're good, but they're not locking teams down, scoring three, six points. Like we've been, like we've grown accustomed to over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, that's one of the areas there, right? You look at that secondary, and I think that's part of the transition. And you look at John Johnson, of course, the leader of the defense, the guy that set everyone up, called the plays. It was more than just his value in terms of his talent, right? He did a lot for that leadership role in the locker room as well. So definitely a loss. You know, there's no way you can really replace him one for one. You're looking at a guy that was a borderline elite safety, a top five guy, probably at his position. And like you mentioned, you got to pick and choose who you want to pay. The Rams elected to pay Leonard Floyd. Uh, who's been good too. So it's, you know, it's not exactly the biggest issue there. But one thing that the Rams did have in terms of their arsenal was a very deep safety room. So I think they felt pretty good about letting a guy like Johnson walk. They've had a lot of success molding safeties over the last handful of years. You're looking at guys from, you know, way back when TJ McDonald's and Rodney McLeod's who both got paid to the LaMarcus Joiners and now John Johnson. So a lot of these guys got paid by the Rams. And I think they felt really good about some of these other guys stepping up, you're looking at Jordan Fuller, a second-year player, Taylor Rapp, who's now healthy, entering his third season. He looks a lot more complete. Nick Scott, a seventh-rounder who's contributed a lot, and we're not even talking about a guy like Terrell Burgess, who is also a second-year player, a former third-round pick. He's barely played at all. So, you know, I think they felt good about their depth at that position. Of course, you know, like I mentioned, they still prioritize stopping the deep coverage. So it's kind of a two-some game in terms of the whole secondary there, but it is some, uh, you know, loss in general, just I think, they haven't been as tight in coverage, like you said, as they were ending off last season. So we'll see if they eventually get there. But through three games so far, they look pretty on par with how they did last year with Brandon Steele's defense. This is an incredible matchup, really, when you break it down. Byron Murphy just took home the Defensive Player of the Week award with his two picks. You had Chandler Jones in Week 1 get the same award. Matthew Stafford now has two awards uh, to uh, the Offensive Player of the Week, and then Kyler Murray was Week 2 Offensive Player of the Week. I mean... You would be hard pressed to find two teams that are rolling like the Rams and the Cardinals. I mean, I just, I'm so excited to turn this game on come Sunday. I guess we should just pivot to our predictions, how we think things are going to go. I mentioned during the betonline.ag read, it's a four and a half point spread. It's been shrinking. It started at six and a half. Uh, I don't know. We'll pass off to Sosa. What are your thoughts on how this game is going to go between the Cardinals at three and zero oh and the Rams at three and zero, oh, and who's going to walk out of there? with their first L of the season. Oh, man, it's a, it's a shame someone has to lose. I, I mean, we're looking at <laughs> one of the best games of the week, arguably the best game of the week. It is going to be so entertaining. A lot of fireworks, in my opinion. You're looking at two great offenses. Um, I had the Rams originally winning this game, so I'll stick with that prediction. I think it'll be relatively close. I'm going to say 38-24 uh, for the Rams. I think they just have that edge up in terms of playing at home, of course. Uh, and they've had the Cardinals number over the last few years. I just feel like Aaron Donald might be a little bit tough to stop on that offensive line. Uh, and they've done a good job at pressuring Kyler Murray a little bit. So I'm going to go with the Rams in a relatively close game, 38, 24. Of course, you know, it's a six point game that, that does mean that it's a one score game, but, uh, and that was nearly the original line. Like you mentioned, uh, close game. I'm just going to go with the home team. I think the Rams are a little bit. Uh, more sturdy in terms of their projection right now, but I'm going to kick it off to you guys. I want to hear wait, what you guys have. Wait, hold on. I don't, I don't know what math is going on <laughs> up where you live. 38, 24 is a 14 point deficit. Oh, yeah. I, I meant, uh, I meant 34, 28. Sorry. Oh, okay. 34, 28. My Let me save there. Cremendous. Yeah. All right, Bo, what, <laughs> what about you? Relative, like the Rams must be rolling. If it's relative, a 14 point game, <laughs> it's relatively close. Yeah. No, but, I, you know what? I think that the the Rams, unfortunately, without their uh, a, a dynamic run game like the the Vikings had with uh, Dalvin Cook, I think that the Arizona Cardinals have a very good chance to make this a one dimensional offense. Now, look, that's their strength: throwing the football downfield. Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford. That's going to be a big 
you know, thing. And in Robert Woods, I would not be shocked if he has his big 2021 coming out party. Uh, and I think, the, you know, it's on the road. So I'm going to give the edge to the Rams. And this thing's going to be just an absolute nail biter. I think that the, the Rams edge out the Arizona Cardinals. And I'm going to say 32 to 29. It's going to be a sweat for you, Sosa. It's going to yeah. be relatively close. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll say 27-24, uh, so a 38-point deficit, according to Sosa's math. Uh, 20, I think 27-24 Rams, it's just the key here is there is no green ribbons in the NFL, but it would be a green ribbon for the Cardinals if they kept this game close because it's a huge step forward. Um, I don't think that they're going to win. It may come down to turnovers, which it normally does. Time of possession is a big deal for the Cardinals. If they can have around 50% time of possession, they're usually in pretty good positions to win. But I will say 27-24 uh, Rams. Now, I, before we get out of here, because we're going a little long per usual with us, um, there's another game, and I'm curious about what you think, because Bo and I talked about this on Wednesday's podcast. 49ers and Seahawks play same time, okay? C San Francisco is 2-1. and one, Seattle is 1-2. and two. Would you rather have San Francisco win moving to three and one and putting Seattle in the doldrums of the NFC West at one and three through four weeks or get weird and have Seattle win and then have Seattle and the and the 49ers be two and two and have one of the Cardinals or the Rams be three and one? I think I'd prefer if the Seahawks took this one uh, only because I huh. am more concerned with San Fran. I genuinely think they are the better football team. So if Seattle can steal one of the, uh, one of those games there, this early one too, it'd probably help. And I mean, they're desperate right now. Let's be honest. They can't drop to one and three in this division. That's going to be problematic. So uh, if there's any hope for them, they basically have to win this game. And that's crazy to say in week four. So uh, this game, a little bit different Two three and O teams. It's going to be a great game. Uh, appreciate you guys so much for listening here. As always, it's a great, uh, duo here to join. I mean, I love joining you guys on the crossovers here. It's going to be fun. Make sure to tune back into the Locked On Rams and Locked On Cardinals podcast throughout the rest of this week as well as next week. We're going to recap these games, of course, and keep you guys fully updated with everything that's going on with the Rams and the Cardinals. Thank you guys for making us your first daily listen. As always, you can find us on Twitter at QB's MEP, at Clancy's Corner, and at Bo Brock. Enjoy this game, and we'll see you guys in the next one.